So here's a quick recap. This is, this is how we defined a hop field network. It was a loopy network. Uh, specifically, we, were, we considered uh, symmetric loopy networks. Every, you, the output of every neuron was connected to the input of every other neuron. So as a result, it was loopy. And the weight from neuron I to neuron J was the same as the weight from neuron J to neuron I. We sort of restricted ourselves to neurons which had a plus minus one output. So which is to say that each neuron was a perceptron uh, whose output could be either plus one or minus one. Specifically, if the affine combination coming into the neuron was positive, the output would be plus one. Otherwise, the output would be minus one. And so the way this behaved, at each time, each neuron receives a, can be thought of as receiving a field which is simply this affine combination coming into the neuron. And if the field is positive, this output becomes positive. Another way to think about it is that if the output is already positive and the field is also positive, the output doesn't change. On the other hand, if the output is currently negative and the field is positive, the output's gonna flip. And vice versa. If the output is currently positive and the field is negative, once again, the output is gonna flip. So at each time, uh, each neuron receives this field, and if the sign of the field matches its own sign, it does not respond. If the sign of the field opposes its own sign, the neuron flips. And so when we do this, we found that the, each, every, every time a neuron flips, it's gonna change the field at the other neurons. Those in turn might flip, those will affect yet other neurons, and this process can go on for quite some time. Although we did see that there was an upper bound for how many such uh, flips uh, they could be before the, before the network stopped, uh, stopped changing. So how many steps, we, uh, uh, how, how many times would the neurons flip? We came up with a criterion based on which we could actually uh, decide when the network would stop evolving. We defined a, uh, an energy function, which is the weighted combination of products of pairs of neurons in the output, where the weight itself is the weight that connects the two neurons. Now, again, remember that this network is symmetric. So this was simply uh, summation over ij, wij, yi, yj. Now, this entire thing can be written in matrix form. So if I if I say y equals y1 through yn, which are the outputs of all of my neurons, then, and my w is a matrix where and so on, then this weights matrix has a specific property. It has two properties. First, we said the network was symmetric. That means the weights matrix is symmetric. Secondly, there is no connection from the output of a neuron to itself. So the diagonal entries of the weight matrix are zero. But once you decide that, then I can just say then implies summation i j w i j y i y j is simply going to be y transpose w y, right? We can just write it out this way. If you expand it out, you're gonna find that this, that this holds. Uh, so in vector form, this energy can be thought of as minus half y transpose w y. So why this half? Because you don't want to double, double count things. Everything is counted just once. And the way it evolves, you can think of the energy of this network as having some landscape over the states. And if you start off the network at some state, it's going to begin evolving and each evolution is going to decrease the energy of the network till it hits a local minimum, at which point it stops evolving. So the network will evolve until it arrives at a local minimum, minimum and the energy contours. So you can think of each of these minima, yes. We'll get to this. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, the uh, function is quadratic. Uh, 
but whether it's convex or concave or, uh, right, uh, you cannot really say, right? Mm -hmm. But there are other criteria that's, that influence the problem, and we'll see that shortly. I'll get to you. So each of these minima is a stored pattern. You can think of these because these are the minima to which the network naturally evolves. So you can think of the network as storing these patterns. And if you start off somewhere in the vicinity of a stored pattern, it's going to evolve into that pattern. So the network can be thought of as remembering these specific patterns for which the energy is minimum. And the network actually uses a content addressable memory in the sense that if you start off with some pattern, some random pattern, that random pattern is going to recall the closest stored pattern. So it's almost like if you, if you have a partial recall of the pattern that the network has stored, it can evolve and give you a full recall of this pattern. So it's a content addressable memory, also called an associative memory. Now, we saw that, with the, we saw that this model is actually uh, a perfect computational analog to spin glasses. So spin glasses are these, dipo uh, uh, are these uh, uh, magnetic materials which have a lot of magnetic dipoles. Each dipole is going to try to align itself to its local field. And so if the local field is pointing in one direction and the dipole currently points in a different direction, the dipole will flip. But if the dipole flips, it's going to change the field in other locations. And so the other dipoles may flip and the whole thing can go on. So uh, we, again, from, a, from the perspective of uh, physics, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, here, here's how the system works. You have a total field at each location in the space, and the field is going to be a contribution of each of the dipoles. It's basically going to be the sum over all the other dipoles, all the dipoles in the, in the medium, uh, of the contribution of each of the dipoles. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's linear. And the contribution of any dipole is going to be inversely proportional to the distance from the dipole. So this constant j is going to be dependent on many factors, including uh, the properties of the material itself, but also on the distance. Something that's very far away will have a very small influence. Something that's very close is going to have a lot of influence. And then you have the external uh, magnetic field. So there's a, there's, a comp there's a total field at each dipole, and if the current dipole aligns up with the field, it's not going to do anything. If it doesn't, it's going to flip. And for this, for every individual dipole, you can think of a potential energy. And again, you probably recall this from physics, that the potential energy of any particular magnetic dipole is going to be its own value times the field at its current location. So this is how we, I mean, this is how we've always defined it. And so the actual energy of the system, the total energy of the system is going to be this term, okay, minus of that, uh, summed over all of the dipoles in the medium, medium. And this term ends up looking a whole lot like the, uh, the energy term we saw for the Hopfield field network. And the system evolves to minimize the energy. The dipoles stop flipping. If any flips result in an increase in energy. So each flip is going to decrease the energy of the system. Now I'm talking about this as a deterministic process. This is actually a statistical mechanical process. So we'll get back to this later. Now this kind of, the relevance of this should become clear by the uh, end of the class. So once again, here's how the spin glass would evolve. It has a total energy and it's going to try to decrease its total energy. This is what happens even with hot objects, magnetic objects. They, they, they try to decrease the current potential energy in the system and they release all the excess energy as heat. So uh, that's basically what would happen over here. It would evolve to, uh, towards a uh, local configuration. So the system remembers its stable state. And this is the kind of property that you, you've, uh, uh, you might have read about shape memory alloys and such like, for instance. You give them a shape, you crumple them, they sort of stretch themselves back into their shape. What is happening over there? Something very akin to this process, although that particular behavior is not dependent entirely on uh, magnetic on, on magnetic fields. Anyway, so here's how the Hopf field network operates. You initialize the network with some pattern, and then at each neuron, you check the local field, and if the neuron, Anthony, I think you should go wash your face. So if the neuron doesn't align itself with the field, uh, it's going to flip. 
and you just you can just loop through the neurons any number of times. And when will it converge? We know that the energy has a natural lower bound because all terms are bounded, all terms are finite. It's a finite, you're summing over a finite number of terms. So uh, this evolution will converge till the energy arrives at a local, it will continue until the energy arrives at a local minimum. So we saw this example of content addressable memory in class. If you built a network to remember these two patterns, then if you initialize the network with this guy, it would evolve to this pattern. On the other hand, if you initialize the network with this guy, it's going to evolve to this pattern. And these are two different things happening over here. Here you have a, a, a degraded version of this in, image and it recalls it perfectly. Here you have a partial version of the image and it recalls it. So these are all behaviors that a half field network, a content addressable memory in general can perform. So when it comes to training the networks, so the first thing we established that th was that such behavior was possible. But then just having such behavior is not sufficient. We want to be able to design the network so that we govern which patterns the network actually remembers. And so this is what we call training the network. We wanted to train the network to store specific patterns or sets of patterns. Yes, Rapna? Uh, suppose the network has 60% of the nodes positive and 40 negative, then the 40 will simply turn into 40? No, they won't. It depends on the, it depends on the weights, right? I mean, I'll give you a very simple example. So if I have two nodes and as and the weight is minus one. Will both nodes have the same sign? No, right? It's going to be either one minus one or minus one one. Anything else will be unstable. Right? So uh, now there are different ways of training this network. And uh, we saw Hebbian learning in the last class, but, there, but I can identify three different approaches. Hebbian learning, something based on principles of geometry and optimization. And so this is the first question, how do we train the network? And the second question is how many patterns can we store? So we looked at Hebbian learning. When you want to store only one pattern, Hebbian learning basically said that the, if I have a specific pattern to store, if I choose that, I, and if I decide that I want to store one minus one minus one, one minus one, for example, over here, then the product of these two guys is one times minus one. So this is going to be minus one. That is the weight that I will assign. And you can see that in this little example of mine. So this one is only going to be stable when the two neurons on either side have opposite signs. So their product is going to be minus one. And so you can see that setting a weight of minus one makes one minus one and minus one one stable, but if both are, both are plus one, one of them is going to flip. Now, if I wanted to have one one to make one one stable, then what would this weight have been? Just going to be plus one, the product of the two, right? So this is just an extension of that basic basic idea. This trivial example can extend over the entire net, and that goes, that gives me the Hebbian learning, uh, uh, the Hebbian rule to train the network. But then I can write this in algebraic form. So let's say I have a specific. So let's say I have a specific uh, uh, pattern y that I'd like to store. Then if I have y1 through yn, then I want the ma weights matrix to be yi, yj. Every entry has got to be yi, yj, right? And this is exactly the same as saying y times y transpose. But if I just write y times y transpose, then what will the diagonal entries be in this case? It's going to be yi squared, which is 1, because they're all plus 1 or minus 1, right? So I want to, di I want to subtract, the di make the entries, diagonal entries 0. So I stopped, subtract i. And so this is the basic rule for training the parameters of the network using Hebbian learning. But this will only store one pattern. How do I store many patterns? So for storing many patterns, we saw that we can do this by simply computing this weight matrix 
for every one of the patterns that we want to store and adding them up. And that will give you a network which sort of remembers all of these patterns, but it comes with its own limitations. So literally, we would just be summing over all of the patterns and we, the product of the, the two neurons at, at, at either edge of each connection in order to compute the weight. Now once again, I can write this in algebraic form. So if I want to store a whole bunch of patterns, I can put all of those patterns into one big network, uh, one big matrix. And so basically this was, this was what I had if I want to store one pattern. If I want to store more than one pattern, then it was going to be Y1, Y1 transpose minus I plus Y2, Y2 transpose minus I, and so on, which is simply going to be summation over all the patterns of YP, YP transpose minus N times R. Now why N? Because you're going to see NP, right? Because you're going to subtract I once for every one of the patterns that you're trying to store. And this again is simply going to be, so, so if I do this, if I write Y equals Y1, Y2, and so on, then this term is going to be Y times Y transpose minus NP. Now it's easy for you to actually work this out, but basically if I put all of the patterns that I would like to store in a matrix, then the outer product of that matrix with itself is going to give me the weights matrix, the Hebbian weights matrix, if I force all the diagonal elements to zero. So if I want to store multiple patterns, basically this is what the uh, weights matrix is going to be, y times y transpose minus np times r, right? So here is the uh, Hebbian learning rule to store multiple patterns. You want each weight to be the product of the neurons on either, either edge of the connection summed over all of the patterns that you'd like to store. Or in algebraic terms, if I put all of the patterns I'd like to store in the matrix Y, then it's gonna be Y times Y transpose minus NPR, yes. How is uh, adding up all the, what's it called, the different patterns, like taking the steps of storing up multiple patterns, so don't you lose information because you're like minus one plus one equals zero somewhere? So we saw this in the last class, right? We went over this, now this, this was the, and uh, if you do something of this kind, mm -hmm. I wasn't very good at explaining this in the last class, but go over the slides because uh, whenever I mess up, then I make up by putting this in the quiz, right? So uh, you're going to have to explain this to me in the quiz. We'll be talking about uh, uh, how these things get confounded. So we found that if you have a network of N neurons, which means that you have N bit patterns, then uh, because you're gonna have one neuron per bit, right? Then with a probability of 0.4, 0 0.4%, which is 0 0.004, or you can store, uh, I mean, uh, if you want a probability that of 0.996, that all of the patterns will be stored stably, then the maximum number of patterns that you can store is about 0.14n. So there was some arithmetic that actually came up. So if you have, with this, so if you have, if you're trying to store 100 bit patterns and if you're using the Hebbian rule, then you can store up to 14 patterns. And if you stored 14 patterns, you still have about a 0 0.004 probability that some of these patterns are not going to be stable. Right. But then we ended with this bold claim that if I have n, an n bit network, I can store up to n orthogonal patterns that they are stationary, although they may not be stable. So where does this claim come from? And that claim comes from, we've already seen heavy and learning. That claim comes from the geometric approach to the whole process of optimization. Now I must warn you that I'm spending a lot of time talking about hop field networks because I don't want to spend as much time talking about Boltzmann machines. Hop field networks are the precursors to Boltzmann machines. And the way Boltzmann machines are generally explained are as generative models with a lot of uh, uh, what is in my opinion gobbledygook uh, statistical explanations for why they work. But then thinking of them 
much more mechanically actually gives you a very good intuition and a perfectly acceptable mathematical explanation. So pay attention, right? So now so let's consider the geometric approach. Now, first, the weights matrix was y times y transpose minus NPI, right? From my perspective, this weights matrix has exactly the same behavior as just y times y transpose. If I don't make the diagonal matrix elements zero, the behavior will not change. So if I just put a connection back to each neuron, the overall network or behavior of the network will not change. How do I prove this? Very simple. Look at the energy for any particular pattern. So for the energy for any particular pattern was Where's the other board? So the, for the energy for any particular pattern was minus half y transpose wy, right? Which was going to be minus half y transpose and this is going to be capital Y, capital Y transpose minus NPIY, right? Which is the same as minus half Y transpose Y, Y transpose Y minus NP times Y transpose Y. So this you get. What is y transpose y? Remember that y is a binary network, a binary pattern. Every bit is either plus one or minus one. So what would y transpose y be? It's just going to be n, right? It's the sum of the squares of the individual components of y. So this guy's, this term is simply going to be, this term is simply going to be summation i y i squared equals Right? So in other words, if I use the, this as my weights matrix, if I use this as my weights matrix, the energy is the same as using this guy as my weights matrix from which I subtract a constant. And that's basically the shifting the entire energy landscape down. So uh, if I use, if I include the self connection for each neuron, it doesn't basically change the behavior although it might change the actual energy values. So that means it's more profitable for us to be able to analyze this guy because it's actually easier to analyze. So let's see, let's see what happens. So henceforth, I'm going to assume that the weights matrix is simply y, y transport. What can you tell me about this, this, this matrix? Anyone? What kind of characteristic will it have? Positive it's positive semi-definite, right? So both of these have the same eigenvalues. The gradients and locations of minima remain the same. And this guy on top of it is a positive semi-definite matrix. And now, once you realize it's a positive semi-definite matrix, what do we know about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of positive semi-definite matrices? They're going to be strictly non-negative. And the eigenvectors are going to be orthogonal. Right? So. Going back to this energy function, I'm reintroducing the bias first. So hold this thought, right? Now let's get to your question. This term here, even with the bias, is a quadratic. And a quadratic for heavy and learning, W is positive semi-definite. In other words, this is convex, right? Because it's positive and semi-definite. If it's positive definite, it has a unique minimum. If it's positive semi-definite, it has a it has a uh, it has a plane, uh, a, a, uh, 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 a linear manifold, which represents all minimums. But then the function itself has a unique minimum. The function is convex, right? Uh, so if I think about this, really, here's what the function looks like. So if this function looks like this, what the heck did I mean by saying it has multiple minima? Anyone? There was a restriction we imposed on our patterns. 
what was that? What kind of patterns were these? Yeah, but more than stable. What is, what is the nature of every component of these patterns? Every pattern is, every, every element is either a plus one or a minus one, right? So where do these patterns reside? On the corners of a hypercube. So this is basically what you're going to see. This is convex. I'm showing this from top. I'm showing all of these ellipses are level sets. And the patterns are only allowed to remain on the corners of a hypercube, right? The only valid positions are the little, are the little yellow positions. So if you actually look at the value of the function at the yellow positions, over that collection, the energy contour is no longer going to have just one minimum, right? Although the underlying function itself has a unique minimum. So in this case, for example, you will see that these two guys have a lower energy value than these two guys, but they both have the same energy value. So in this two-bit two, two -bit case, there are two distinct minima, the two yellows in the closer corner. The ones farther away are, 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 for, are, are not minima, and if you initialize the network over here, it's, going to, it's always going to travel down these edges. It's going to travel to one of the closer corners to the center. Right? So these would be the stored patterns, and the ones far away are uh, the stored values of y are the ones where all adjacent corners are lower on the quadratic, and the ones farther away are going to be the, the patterns that are not remembered. They go away, right? So uh, more in general, again, remember that the patterns, all patterns are on the corners of a hypercube. And going back here, you can see why if this pattern is stored, there must be a corresponding pattern on the other side that is stored as well, simply because the quadratic is, is a, has, has a symmetric uh, uh, contour, right? So uh, meaning if I had store something over here, here, maybe something over here stored, it gets stored. Every pattern is going to have its ghost that is uh, stored. Now, if a pattern is stored, its ghost is stored, what about the stored patterns? What can we say about the stored patterns themselves? It would seem to us that if you want to store a pattern, now going back here to this image, if this guy must not be confused, so think about it, think about it in terms of three dimensions. So if I try to would it be better for me to store these two patterns or to try to store these two patterns? Which one would make more sense? I mean, ignoring the fact that, that the mirror image of every pattern is also stored. Now, if you just consider, try to store these two patterns, the difference between the two is only one bit. So you're allowed, even if you make a one bit flip, the network is gonna be confused. What are you actually trying to recall? So you want to give a maximum number of bits difference between any two patterns. That way there are more bits that you, can go, that you can go wrong with, and the network will still be able to recall the specific pattern, right? So if I give you two n bit patterns, what is the maximum number of bits in which the two can differ? n over two, we saw that, right? Because if I go to more than n over two, it's like flipping the patterns, and if you flip them, then the, the difference is actually less than n over two. Again, keeping in my mind that a pattern and its inverse are the same thing. So as far as we are concerned, as far as we are concerned, one, 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 uh, one, one is the same as minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. These two are the same, they're just ghosts of each other, right? So now if I try to make some guy different from this one, so I say one, one, minus one, minus one. My claim is that this, these two are as far apart as, as can possibly be. Can you come up with a pattern that differ in more than these many bits? Not really, because if I think of something like one, one, if I make this one, 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 minus one, minus one, minus one, it differs from these in three bits, but it differs from this in only one bit. So the best you can do is to be for two patterns to be n by two apart, n by two bits apart, right? Stephen, make sense? Uh, not yet. Okay, what, where did I lose you? Uh, 
Okay, so uh, we said that if this guy is a minimum, this guy is also a minimum because it's a quadratic, right? And so that means that if I, if I want something to be, uh, if, if something is three bits far away from this pattern, it can be only one bit away from the negation, right? So given that, the maximum diff distance between the two is going to be n by, two by n by two bits, simply because the negation is the same as the original pattern. And in this case, observe something. If I take the, if both of them are ex different, different exactly n over two bits, then if I take the component-wise product of every pair of bits and sum them up, that's basically the inner product between the two bits, two patterns, right? That's going to be one times one plus one times one, plus one times minus one, plus one times minus one. What is that? That's zero. So the two bits are orthogonal. When two bit patterns differ in half the bits, they're gonna be orthogonal, right? So orthogonal patterns are as far apart as you can, as you can get. You cannot get farther, right? So now let's think of what happens when I actually evolve when the network actually evolves. So, so when the network evolves, you're saying y equals sine of w times y, right? This, is, this, this was the basic activation that we were using. And individually, basically, if you, th if you think of uh, any particular vector, so let's say this is a story, this, this is a current pattern. What does W times Y do to the vector? It changes it and scales it, it moves it to a different position, right? This is a standard matrix transformation. So if I, if I take W times Y and W times my y, y may end up out here. And then when you take the sine operation, what happens? This guy gets mapped on, so this is a square, right? It's going to get mapped on to the nearest corner. So any times you do a w times y, the vector moves, to some, and it may become longer, the angle changes, but then you're zapping it down to the nearest corner. That is the, that is the operation that you're actually performing. So what can you tell me about a vector that doesn't change? If the vector is stable, then what can we say about the transformation? After you multiply it by W, whatever result you get must lie in the same orth hint for it to get mapped onto the same corner, right? Basically, you want sine of WY to be the same as Y. Otherwise, the vector is going to go to, you know, when, you, when it transforms, you know, when the, when the network evolves, the vector is going to go to some other position, right? So basically, a pattern is stored if sine of W times YP is the same as YP. This is how, this is the basic requirement that we have. So our objective is to train the W such that this behavior holds. For every pattern that we want to store, sine of W times YP must be the same as YP, right? And so what is the simplest solution, right? If YP is an eigenvector of W, then W times YP and the corresponding eigenvalue is positive, then W times YP has, this is basically a scaled version of YP. The sine of that is going to be YP itself, right? I mean, the definition of an eigenvector is uh, we had, if you have an eigenvector y, then wy equals lambda y, right? We have this. And if lambda is positive, that means the sine of wy is going to be the same as y itself. So the easiest way for me to, uh, if this is what I get, right, how many patterns can I store? Now let's go back to our question and think about the geometry. I'm going to be able to store as many patterns as there are eigenvectors to W. Correct? 
because each pattern is going to be stable. So here's a simple solution. I can store up to n, so my claim is if I have n neurons, I can store up to n patterns. Why? Because an n cross n matrix can have n eigenvectors. Again, our weights matrix is symmetric. Our weights, our weights matrix is symmetric, which means all the eigenvectors are orthogonal to one another. In an n-dimensional space, how many orthogonal eigenvectors can, or how many orthogonal vectors can you have? As many as the axes, right? So only n. So which means that I can design my weights matrix to make up to n patterns stable. This is by design. Now something something happens. It's I'll walk around. Okay. So this is by design. Uh, something happens which introduces undesirable memories, but we'll get to that, right? So if I have patterns that differ in n over two bits, I can store up to n of these guys. And now, the eigenvectors of any symmetric matrix are going to be orthogonal. The eigenvalues may be positive or negative. We know this. So how can I design a network that stores y1 through yp? I'm going to design my w such that all of these guys are eigenvectors of my matrix. Very simple, right? Once I make them eigenvectors, I'm guaranteed that those things are stable. So, and uh, if I have n such patterns, then I'm going to be, then this matrix is going to be complete, right? So here's a simple solution. I can stick all of my y1 through yk into a matrix. So long as my patterns are orthogonal, again, I'm speaking strictly of orthogonal patterns, right? If my patterns are orthogonal, then I can stick them into a matrix. And this lambda is going to be my matrix of eigenvalues. And I just say y times lambda times y transpose, that is going to give me my weights matrix. Now observe that this is exactly the same. If all of my eigenvalues are one, this is the same as the Hebbian rule. So what the Hebbian rule is really doing, to answer your question, why this just doing this should be able to give me something that works, the Hebbian rule is simply composing a weights matrix where each of the patterns that I'm trying to store is an eigenvector if the patterns are all orthogonal to one another. Now this doesn't hold if the patterns are not orthogonal, then, they, then you have to work harder to make the uh, weights matrix uh, uh, work for you. And in that case, you won't, be just, you won't just be saying y equals wy, you're going to have to depend on the transformed uh, vector lying within the same orthint, right? Now in reality, if I have an n-bit network, I may not want to store n patterns. I want to store fewer than n patterns. Then what about the remaining patterns? What about the, so those n patterns are going to give me n eigenvectors. For the rest of them, I can take a bunch of other vectors which are also orthogonal to the vectors that I'm trying to store, stick them into this matrix, and compose my weights matrix using this extended, extended y. But then these other patterns are patterns that I do not want to remember. So if I do not want to remember them, then I basically want those patterns to go away, right? So for to do that, I can make the corresponding eigenvalues zero, or I can make those eigenval corresponding eigenvalues any nasty number, just to make sure that the energy of those guys is in the wrong direction, like making them negative. Yeah. Get to that, right? So you're, uh, so uh, when we have n orthogonal or near orthogonal patterns, this is exactly how we're going to store the uh, compose our weights. But then here is the problem, right? If I have n orthogonal vectors, any vector in the space can be written as a linear combination of these orthogonal vectors, correct? So which means that w, so, so w times y for any vector is simply going to be a1 times wy1 plus a2 times wy2 and so on. If I've composed my weights matrix to have all the eigenvalues be one, that simply gives me a1 times y1. It gives me this original combination right back, which gives me y right back. So this is the problem with Hebbian learning. All of the eigenvalues are one, which means that if you have a full complement of n orthogonal vectors that you're storing, they're all stable. Meaning once you set the network into those patterns, they're not going to change. 
But then every other pattern, n-bit pattern in the universe is also stable because w times y equals y for pretty much every pattern. So in other words, if I'm trying to store n orthogonal patterns, I'm going to get two raised to n minus n fake memories, things that I don't want to remember that the system also remembers, right? And so there's a completely useless network. It doesn't really remember anything. Anything you give it, it recalls. So it's been now, suppose I'm trying to store fewer than n patterns, I still have the same problem. If my n patterns are orthogonal, then any vector which lies entirely in the subspace spanned by these guys is also going to be recalled perfectly. So in other words, any vector that lies, binary vector that lies entirely in the subspace span by y1 through yk is not going to, is going to be a memory that, and not all of them are memories that you actually want. So the only thing that goes, that is working for you is to, is to kind of hope that in that subspace there are no other binary vectors, right? But that's not going to hold because the projection, you know, projections still work in a bad way. So, all of this happens because all of our eigenvalues are one. So because the eigenvalues are one, you have this behavior that any vector that falls in a subspace spanned by these stored memories can be transformed by the network and the net vector itself comes back, right? So let's see if we can actually uh, deal with what we can do with this. But before that, all of this analysis has to do with orthogonal vectors. So when you literally take vectors that are the farthest apart that they can possibly be, then you end up with uh, uh, really bad memories. By the way, can you guys turn your tablets? Thank you. Right? So tablets are laptops. Now, uh, these, uh, so if I give you non-orthogonal vectors and I try to compose my weights matrix in the same way, can I predict how the network will evolve? Turns out you can. You can predict the evolution of the network perfectly because you can actually decompose these, these weights matrices into their eigenvectors. You can perform Lanczos iterations and it will tell you exactly how each vector is going to change. So the bottom line is that with a network of n units, the maximum number of stationary patterns that I can store is actually exponential in n. Where did that exponential in n come in? Because if I compose my weights matrix using n orthogonal vectors, pretty much every pattern is stationary. And how many n-bit patterns do we have? Two raised to n. So the number of patterns that, you can, that actually become stationary is exponential in n. So if you want to store a specific set of K patterns, it turns out you can always build a network for which all K patterns are stable, provided K is less than or equal to M. But this may come with many parasitic memories. This is basically what we saw right now, right? But then can we actually try to figure out how to build this network, which isn't something as lame as just simply performing heavy and learning? So uh, we saw the Hebbian learning rule. We saw from the geometric perspective that Hebbian learning basically just, uh, in, if your patterns were really far apart, Hebbian learning was just composing, trying to make these patterns eigenvectors. If the patterns were not far apart, then you still had this issue that uh, you are in, you're likely to end up with parasitic memories for which, uh, which the memory, will, which the network will remember regardless of what it, what, what it is you really want to remember. So can we somehow figure out how to store, build a network that stores a desired number of patterns, set of patterns, without having corresponding parasitic memories? This is the question. So here's the story so far. Hopfield nets with n neurons can store up to 0.14 n patterns with 0.996 probability of recall. It assumes that all patterns are equally important. So when they were orthogonal, we gave them all eigenvalues of one. What does that mean? That every pattern that you want to store is presented once during training, right? All of them are equally important. In theory, the number of stationary uh, 
points in a Hopfield network can be exponential in n, and the number of intentionally stored patterns can be as large as n. So there's a difference between stationary points and intentionally stored patterns. For example, when I was trying to store n orthogonal patterns, though it was my intent that those patterns must have must be stationary, and I could build a network that made those n patterns stationary. But what happened as a consequence was that every other pattern also became stationary. So uh, I had an exponential number of stationary patterns, but the intentionally stored patterns were only n. You see the difference between the intentionally stored patterns and the set of stationary patterns, right? And so what we want to do is to minimize the gap between these two. We want to keep as store as large a number of patterns as we can by intention but minimize the number of fake memories. So that leads us to an optimization-based framework. Now let's go back there. here. Let's consider the energy function. Now if I have a target pattern, something that I want to remember, the energy must be a local minimum for that target pattern, right? And if I want the pattern to be robust, I want that energy to be, I want the energy to be as low as possible but because that means that I can change many bits, and the network is still going to evolve back into that pattern, right? At the same time, I don't want it to have parasitic memories. So if I don't want it to have parasitic memories, it means that I want the energy for all the other patterns to be as high as possible. So that when I set the network at those, at, at those patterns and the network begins to evolve, it can't just sit at those patterns. So, now, again, caveat, you can't really expect to store more than n patterns. You can show that you cannot intentionally store more than n patterns. What we are trying to do is to actually see if we can design the network so that we can store the n patterns and make them memorable, which means that, that I want to have n local minima, but the rest of the energy of the rest of the configurations must be higher than, the, and than these n local minima, right? How do I do this? Very easy. I can literally write out the energy function and say, compute this weights matrix such that this energy function is minimized at my target, target patterns. But this by, by itself is not sufficient, right? Because what, what will happen is that this guarantees, if you actually solve for this, this guarantees that your target patterns are remembered but it has no assurance about parasitic memories. The other guys might also be remembered. So what you really want to do is this one here, where you say you want to minimize the energy at the target patterns, and over every other pattern, patterns that you don't really want to store, you want to maximize the energy, right? So you have the new objective function. Did I lose you? Okay, so I have the new objective function, which says I want the total energy over all the target patterns, and I want this to be minimized, and the total energy at all the patterns that I don't want the network to remember, I want this to be maximized. So here's what I'm going to, now before this, I might have missed a point somewhere here, let me see, did I? Okay. Now remember that when I'm presenting these patterns for the network to remember, I don't need to net present every pattern, this target pattern, the same number of times. So if I'm trying to store four patterns, I don't need to present each of the four the same number of times. If, if for example, pattern one is more important than pattern two, then during training I can present pattern one more frequently than I present pattern two, right? So one of the ideas we want to keep in mind is that if you assign a relative importance to the patterns, we can present them different numbers of times, and the, this will change the manner in which the weights, weights matrix is learned. And that's something that we're actually going to take advantage of. So now let's just assume that this is our new objective function. If this is our new objective function, then I can use a, so again, this is the objective function. This is the total energy of the target patterns this is the total energy of the non-target patterns. I'm trying to minimize this, so I can use gradient descent. 
and the gradient descent is, I start off with some weights and this is just the standard gradient descent rule, right? And this guy, these terms are the derivatives of the energy terms. Now, now we know that uh, if I have y times half of y transpose wy, then the half, right? The gradient of y transpose wy is simply y y transpose. You've done this in your homeworks. You know this. Uh, you, so basic, basically, what happens is that this term here is simply the sum, the derivative of this guy is simply the sum of the outer products of the patterns that you're trying to stir. The derivative of this guy is the sum of the outer patterns of the pattern, uh, outer products of the patterns that you don't want the network to stir. And the difference between the two simply ends up being your gradient, and this gives you your gradient descent rule. Right? Now, here I can emphasize the importance of a pattern by repeating. So when I perform this summation over here, if some patterns are more important to remember than others, I'm going to present them more frequently. Some patterns are less important, I'm going to present them less frequently. This term is more complex, right? How many terms am I actually summing this over? This is, I'm summing this over every pattern that I don't want to remember. So that's if I have n bit patterns, I'm still summing over two raised to n possible patterns. That's an exponentially large number, right? So do, you, do I really need to perform this summation over all of them? I don't. To understand why not, let's go back and look at the energy contour again. You typically have an so with the current set of the setting of the weights, you're going to have an energy contour which is something like this. This is over the corners of the hypercube. The actual energy function itself is a, is a quadratic, right? It's, it's a bowl. Now, if these are the target patterns, what I want to do is to push the energy of the target patterns down. That's what the first term is doing. The second term is trying to push the energy of all the non-target patterns up, right? I don't need to push all of these guys. If I just pushed up the valleys and pushed down my target patterns, I should achieve exactly the same, same objective, right? Which means that I don't need to actually consider the exponential set of non-target patterns. It's enough for me to just consider the valleys. So uh, the, uh, basically, if you raise every valley, eventually they'll move up above the target patterns and vanish. And they're gonna leave, anytime you encounter a valley, you push it up. You keep pushing up valleys. And eventually only the target patterns will remain. How do I actually identify valleys? Now, to, to be able to do this, I have a current W. I must identify the valleys. So how do I do that? Very simple. I initialize the network randomly and let it evolve. If I initialize the network randomly and evolve, it's going to end up in a valley, right? So I do this a bunch of times. I collect my valleys and I push them up. That's about all I have to do. So this is what the update rule now changes to, that you, 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 the, instead of the regular gradient, you're going to take the sum of the outer products of the target patterns and subtract from it the sum of the outer products of the patterns at the energy values. And this gives you your new, uh, your new modified gradient rule. Right? So initialize W, compute the total outer product of all target patterns, where you present more important patterns more frequently, and then randomly initialize the network several times, let it evolve, let it settle in a valley, compute the total outer product of all the valley patterns, and update your weights, very simple. So this is just your uh, a pseudocode for that, right? Now, do we need to randomly initialize? How important is it for me to randomly initialize in order to detect valleys? Again, you can go back and chip off at this computation to make things simpler. It turns out that what I'm really interested in is to make my memories robust. So I want there to be no other valleys in the vicinity of my memories. So instead of randomly initializing, I can actually start at my target memories. This guy doesn't bother me. He's very far away from any useful memory. 
So even if I have a fake memory, I'm going to let it be. I'm going to try to focus on making my memories really good. So this means you start off at the, this you ignore, and you try to, you start off at the target memories that you're trying to store and let the network evolve. And it's going to come, arrive at a value downstream of the memory that you're trying to store. And those you raise, right? And that gives me my modified uh, training rule where, of course, this term is exactly the same as before. But for the second term, I'm going to initialize the network with each target pattern and let the network evolve till it arrives at a valley and I'm going to push it up. Questions? No. So, okay. But then, this is still not sufficient, right? So here's my uh, pseudocode for this. This is still not sufficient because what might happen is that since you're treating each pattern independently of every other pattern, you have to be careful about where you actually end up. So for example, I might have another, if I start off from this guy and I have another pattern very close to the valley, maybe on the other side, when I'm updating for this pattern, I initialize from here and let the ball roll. It's going to end up at this valley. It's going to pull it up. In the process, it's going to pull up another pattern that I really want to store. You don't want that to happen either, right? So instead of letting the ball go all the way to the valley, you can say that I start off at my current location. And keeping in mind that there's really no need to raise the entire surface of every valley, what we will do is just try to raise the neighborhood of each target memory. So if this is the pattern that I'm trying to store, I'm going to push this pattern down, and I'm going to push the region just around the current pattern up. And how can I do that? I start off at the current location and let the net network evolve, but I don't let it evolve to convergence. I only let it evolve for one or two steps. And then it gets someplace downstream, down energy from my stored pattern and that I pull up. So what happens is that you, and you ensure that your patterns end up in valleys and the regions around it go up. And if you keep doing this enough, eventually those valleys are going to get broad and the patterns become nice and robust and the computation stays tractable. Because now the amount of computation that you perform becomes proportional to the number of patterns that you're trying to store and doesn't become dependent on the shape of the energy surface itself. Whereas in everything else, if the valley was really deep, you had to let it run several times before you got to the valley, right? So here is the modified algorithm. Do until convergence, satisfaction, or death from boredom, just this. You sample your target patterns. Uh, you, on your tamp, and from the sample target patterns, you compute this good outer product, the locations where you're trying to minimize the energy. Then from each of these locations, you let the network evolve for a small number of steps, two or four steps. Arrive at new patterns. Compute the average outer product or the sum outer product at these new patterns and pull the network up at those locations. So uh, here's the story so far. Hop field nets with n neurons can store up to 0.14 n patterns using Hebbian learning, but it still causes a problem between intentionally stored patterns and parasitic patterns. So instead, we can try to create networks that store up to order n memories through optimization. And what this does is that it explicitly composes the weights of the network such that the energy of the target patterns is as small as possible and the valley around the target patterns is as broad and is always higher than the target pattern. And this will actually give you very nice content addressable memory. Yes? Two questions. One is uh, in the algorithm, where are you pushing up the uh, neighborhood? Uh, and, okay. and, uh, so that's what we had way back, right? So this was. If you go back, so this is what we were doing. This is what, this was the, if you look at, we were trying to minimize the target energy and 
maximize the energy at other locations. So if you take the derivative of this objective function, this guy comes from the target, this guy comes from the rest of the patterns, right? So that was the neighborhood, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this guy, wait a minute. This term, so this is trying to push down the energy at the current point. This is the location that you arrive at after a few iterations. And this is pushing up the energy at those points. So this is raising the neighborhood. This is lowering the target pattern. So this is ignoring this. And now with this method, you're focusing on uh, the uh, recall of your memory, and you're not worrying about stuff that's far away from anything useful. In the graph, uh, this one is so this guy, this guy is being ignored. So, so we said this, that when we began talking about valleys, we're going to ignore this guy and try to raise up the valleys near the target patterns, right? So, questions? Now, all of this still gives a, only gives us a network which can store up to n patterns. How can I try to store more than n patterns? All right, I'm just keeping upping the ante a little bit. We saw what we can do, what we can store. We tried to saw how we can store those robustly. We saw that. Just trying to store, we, we can store, if you want to store far fewer than n patterns, simple Hebbian learning will do it, although not very well. I can push this up to n patterns by using an optimization trick. But for an n bit string, I can store only n patterns still. There's no guarantee for anything more than that. In fact, theoretically, I can show you that if my network has n neurons, then I can store at most n patterns by intention. But then now I want to store more than n patterns. What can I do? So what I will do is this very simple trick. I'm going to add a large number of neurons whose actual values I don't really care about. So what does this mean? Uh, so if I, for, to my n neurons, if I add k neurons, the new capacity is going to be n plus k. Although I only care about the pattern of the first n neurons. We are only interested in n bit neurons. So basically what I'm doing is, do I have the figure here? Yeah. I'm going to partition my network into two, two components. These are the neurons whose actual values I'm interested in. These are the neurons whose actual values I'm not interested in. So these I will call the visible neurons. These I will call the hidden neurons. And these can be set to store anything to store a visible pattern. Now, pictorially, what does that mean? So let's say I'm trying, I'm trying to store n-bit patterns. So here is an n-bit pattern that I'm trying to store. What I will do is append to this n-bit bit pattern a bunch of random bits. And now suddenly it becomes n plus k bits. And I know that I can store n plus k patterns of n plus, n plus k bits. So I will compose a network to store these extended patterns. When I perform recall, I'm going to ignore the final k bits and only focus on the first 10 bits. So I've expanded the capacity of the network by adding some rubbish. And this actually allows me to use a larger network and have greater storage capacity, right? So these are my don't care bits. Now, how do I actually fill in the don't care bits? How do I expand my n bit patterns? I can do this randomly. I can flip a coin for each bit. I can even, uh, for in fact, if I want to assign importance to different patterns, n bit patterns, I can create multiple extended patterns for each of these guys and try to store them all. There are different ways of manipulating the whole thing, right? And uh, once I decide what these patterns are, I can just use the standard optimization trick and learn the parameters of the network to store these extended patterns. But then, and to retrieve, same thing. I'm going to initialize the network anyhow. It's going to arrive at the n plus k bit pattern. I ignore the final k bits. I get the n bit pattern that I want, right? So easy enough. 
but this is not taking advantage of a key feature of the extended patterns. And what is this? That if I make errors in recalling the k bits, I don't care. I only want to make sure that I'm correct in the first 10 bits. So the moment I begin filling in rubbish to expand the memories, then it not only increases the capacity of the network, it also gives me this beautiful extra bonus that if I make memories in the other rubbish, I really don't care, right? And so how do I actually take advantage of this? This is, to do this, we're going to have to change our perspective of the hop field network a little bit. Uh, we want to view the hop field network now differently. We want to see it as a probabilistic machine. So what do I mean by a probabilistic machine? Let's take a quick look. Now, so for each pattern, I can think of E of Y as the energy, which is minus half Y transpose W Y, right? But I can also think of, so I'm trying to minimize the energy. I can completely artificially compose this probability distribution function, which is E raised to minus E Y. And so minimizing the energy is the same as maximizing this probability, right? So I've changed the perspective and converted it to a probabilistic machine. Now, I'm not doing this completely randomly. There is a, there is a logic behind this. And I gave you the reason for this logic, or I sort of mentioned how we would arrive at the logic at the beginning of the class. We'll see what happens, right? So this distribution is the so-called Boltzmann distribution, named after Boltzmann. Now, if I think of something like this, look at what happens. When I take the sum of the energies over all of the target patterns, where I repeat more important patterns more frequently, that is the same as saying I'm taking a weighted combination of these guys, where this alpha basically assigns more importance to more important patterns. So also, when I take a sum over the energies of all the patterns that I don't want to remember, I can once again think of this as some weighted combinations of these guys. And this is really what we did, right? We said the patterns that are in the valleys are more important than patterns that are far away. So we actually implicitly did this. Let me make this explicit. And we're taking a weighted combination of the energies of these various patterns. This guy looks like an expectation, right? These weights sum to one. So this is like saying this is an expectation over some distribution of the target patterns. This is an expectation over some other distribution of the spurious memories. And so I can rewrite the whole thing as saying this gradient over here has two components. The first is the expectation over my over the distribution of the target patterns that I'm trying to store. Some patterns are more important than others. And this component is an expectation over the distribution represented by the network itself, where the probability of any particular configuration was given by you know, e raised to minus the energy of the configuration, as we just saw. It turns out that math, the math doesn't change. All that change is that you know, instead of looking at it like that, you're looking at it like this. But other than that, nothing really changes, okay? Now, where does this crazy probabilistic uh, interpretation come from? For this, we go back to our good old friend, the spin glass. The behavior of the Hopfield net is analogous to an annealed, the annealed dynamics of a spin glass, which is characterized by a Boltzmann distribution. So what does that mean? Now, consider this thermodynamic uh, uh, system that we spoke of, ferromagnetic material, which is at some temperature, right? When I say that, when I, if each, each bit flips to align itself with the local field, is that really the behavior of the system? No, the behavior of the system is not so, not so deterministic. These are statistical uh, uh, phenomena. The systems are statistical. So what happens is that within this Within this system, each of the states has a specific energy associated with it. Some states have more energy, some states have lesser energy. And the system actually, the state, and the, the uh, system is actually continuously changing. The state is continuously changing and it's based on the temperature of the system. 
the hotter the system is, the more it keeps rapidly changing between states. When it's really cool, it's happy at one state. Although it gets there, which state is something that we'll have to figure out. So what we are actually characterizing is the probability of the state and the expected value of the state. So uh, to get into the physics a little bit, a thermodynamic system at temperature T can exist in one of many states, potentially infinite. At each time, the probability of finding the system at a temperature T is something, PT of S. It's a function of T, right? Now, at each state, the system has some potential energy. So when I say potential energy, this is the capacity of the system to do work when it, when it is at that state. If the water is out up here, that is the capacity of the, the water to do work. And then it comes down here, that, that potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy, which, which powers your bulbs. So at each state, there's a certain amount of energy, that the uh, capacity that the system has to do work, to convert it maybe to kinetic energy or something else. So the overall expect inter and internal energy of the system, now the system keeps bouncing around between states, right? So if it's bouncing around between states, at any given time, it has a different capacity to do work. So what is the, X? this is something you saw in physics, maybe you didn't quite register it. But at any given time, the system has a different capacity to do work. What is the expected capacity to do work? It's just this guy. The average over all the states, yes. How do you do the summation for infinite values? Is this the integrate over here? So these are, this is discrete. Oh, discrete, okay. Yes, right? So, but then there's something getting in the way of all of this, which is to do with the entropy. So when the system is at a, if the system has a probability PT of S of being in any state, then the entropy of the system is just summation over all states of P log P, negative minus P log P. This is what keeps the system, this is the randomness of the system in the system. The more random the system is, the less you're able to harness it, the less, less work it can do, right? So the so-called Helmholtz free energy of the system is a combination of the expected internal energy minus some constant times the entropy of the system. And if you just let the system be, uh, if you just raise the temperature of a system and hold the temperature constant, the system is gonna begin evolving and keep flipping between states until it uh, eventually arrives at a situation where at an equilibrium situation, it, it is going to try to minimize its Helmholtz free energy. A system always tries to arrive at a minimum energy configuration. And so it's going to, and the only thing it can change is the probability with which it, it, it visits the states because the energy of a state is fixed. And so, and K and T are fixed. So what it will do is it's going to anneal. It's going to, it is going to modify the frequency with which it, it visits the different states until this whole thing is minimized. And if you actually take the derivative of this Helmholtz free energy and set it to zero and solve for, what you, uh, for the probability distributions of the various states, you're gonna end up with this probability for any state, which is, going to, which is simply the exponent of minus ES, which is the energy of the state divided by KT, where K is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature. Now, so basically, again, observe that the, the dependence on T, at T is in Kelvin. So at T equals zero, this term becomes infinite. It's actually going to settle deterministically in the least lowest energy configuration and just stay there. And at other time, at the other temperatures, it's going to keep bouncing around, but the, the equilibrium distribution, probability distribution of a state is given by this Boltzmann or the Gibbs distribution. So what about our guy? If you look at this one, when we spoke of this one, this is just basically the Boltzmann distribution, assuming a Boltzmann constant of one and a temperature of one. Very simple, right? So that's where this probabilistic, because we are basically computing an analog of, of the spin glass, the probability distribution that we use, the Boltzmann distribution, is literally an, an analog of the steady state distribution of a spin of a thermodynamic system. Right? 
Now, this leaves, leads us to another very interesting conclusion, right? What is that? So, the equilibrium probability, the conclusion is that the system now no longer responds deterministically. At each time, it's going, it actually, at each time, it actually changes state, but it's going to change state with some probability. What is the probability with which it changes state? So consider this guy. Uh, so this is what I'm calling a stochastic Hopfield network. It models a probability distribution with st over states, where a state is a binary string. More specifically, it models a probability Boltzmann distribution. The parameters of the model are the weights of the network. And the probability that the network will be in any state P of S is simply given by this term over here. It's, in other words, this network is a generative model. It actually generates states according to different probabilities. Right? But then let's consider this situation. How does it change state? How likely is it to change from one state to another? Consider two states which are identical in all bits except the ith bit. In the first case, the ith bit is plus one, and the second case, the ith bit is minus one. So now the probability distribution of the probability of this one, P of S, is the probability that the ith bit is plus one given the rest of the bits times the probability of the rest of the bits, right? The probability of S prime is the probability that SI is minus one given the rest of the bits times the probability of the rest of the bits. So if I take the log of these two probabilities and take the, consider the difference between the two, this second term goes away and all you're going to be left with is the log of the probability that the ith bit is one given the remaining bits minus the log of the probability that the ith bit is minus one, given, given the remaining bits. Or, because this guy is simply one minus this one, the ith bit can either be plus one or minus one, I can write this as the log of the probability of the, that the ith bit is one, divided by one minus the, log, the probability that the ith bit is one. So, nothing magical, I haven't written anything particularly complicated out here, right? Now, let's look at the log of the probability of, so that's, this is basically log PS minus log PS prime, right? What does log PS look like? Log PS is simply, again, the probability of any state was some exponent, was e raised to the, uh, to minus of the energy of the state, right? So log PS is simply going to be minus ES plus a scaling constant. Now this energy has many contributions because the energy again was summation ij. This is what we had, this is, this is what the energy looked like, right? So I can pull out the ith component as yi times summation day j wij yj plus a bunch of other terms that don't involve the ith neuron, so I can write it like so. So this guy here, when yi is plus one, it's simply going to be the summation, or when si is plus one, it's simply, simply going to be the summation of the weights, it, this, should, this should have been wij, but uh, summation of the weights plus the bias, right? And when the bit is minus one, this is going to be minus of the same term, that's all it is. So we haven't actually changed, and now, if I subtract this term from the first guy, that's going to be log of PS minus log of PS prime. The not I component goes away. The not I component goes away. All that remains is the affine combination of the outputs of the other neurons arriving at the current neuron. So in other words, the log of the probability that the ith bit is going to be plus one divided by the probability that the ith bit is going to be minus one is this affine combination. If you work this out, you basically get that the probability that the ith bit is plus one given the remaining bits is the logistic function, our favorite logistic function that we've seen many times. <laughs>
it's kind, of, it's kind of beautiful. No matter, you know, you can keep working through all of these different arithmetics and somehow magically they come back to the logistic function. That's good. So uh, now what does this really mean in terms of the evolution of a Boltzmann machine? I'm going to define a Hopfield network now as a stochastic system. Each neuron is now a stochastic unit with a state SI. And this SI is going to take either value one, or in this case, zero. I'm going to change it from minus one to, uh, to zero based on this affine combination, based on the logistic function, which is computed using all the other neurons. So this ends up looking like, a, like, like exactly like a uh, single network, one, uh, one layer of a, an MLP, except with loops, where the activations are sigmoids. Right? So very beautiful. So the Hopfield network is a probability distribution over binary sequences, and the conditional distribution of the individual bits is a logistic function. So if I want to run the network, all I really have to do is this. I'm going to set the network somehow. I'm going to cycle through the neurons. And at each neuron, I'm going to randomly set the neuron to either plus 1 or 0 uh, or minus 1 according to this logistic function. And I can keep cycling through till all of the neurons are uh, set. Now, this is very different from the energy-based update. But what, 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 what has happened is that I've converted the energy-based update, which is deterministic, to a slightly stochastic version. That's about all that happened, right? And after many, many iterations, I keep doing this. At some point, the whole thing is going to stabilize. And then I can just look at the states of the various neurons, and I get a sample from this distribution. So how exactly do we exploit this? We'll see this in the next class. I'm two minutes over. Questions? Next class. Thank you.